Okay, so here we are back again with lesson 25, the second lesson on quantum mechanical formalism. First thing I want to discuss is the whole notion of the statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics. The idea here is that if you decompose a quantum state into eigenstates of some observable, and you measure that observable, the probability of measuring a particular value is the square of the amplitude that that eigenstate shows up in the superposition. So if you have, let's take an example. Let's say we have a wave uh, superposition, a, a quantum mechanical superposition of three eigenstates of some observable, and we want to know what's the probability of measuring the particle in the state three. So in, in this state, in this case, it's E3, the, one of the basis states. And you can look at that superposition and see right away that the amplitude of being in the state E3 is the square root of one third. In other words, the amplitude of being in the state E3, given that you start out in the state psi, is the square root of one. And the, uh, and the square of that number is just one third. So we end up with a probability of one third. Okay, how do we calculate expectation value? So let's say we know we're in a state, psi, and we wanna know the expectation value of the energy. Well, the formal way to do that is to calculate the quantity that you see on the screen there. But if you put in a representation of psi as a superposition of energy eigenstates, so that means that psi is equal to a sum of amplitude times basis ket. Then the bra version of that, of course, is the sum of the amplitude complex conjugate times the corresponding basis bra. And you expand that double sum, as you see here. Notice that the Hamiltonian acting on an eigenstate, or an eigenket, is just the energy of that state times the eigenket back again. So that converts the operator, the Hamiltonian operator, into a number, the eigenvalue. But that eigenvalue can then come outside since it's just a number. And you can see that you're just going to get um, the Kronecker delta, delta nm, which is going to reduce the double sum to a single sum. And also the m's and the n's are all going to have to be the same. So cm star cn becomes cn magnitude squared. And you can see right away what you get is the probability of measuring the nth eigenvalue times the value of the nth eigenvalue. This is just a normal statistical expectation value. So that turns out rather nicely. Also in this chapter, there's a, there's a section on the uncertainty principle. It's a generalized version of the uncertainty principle. And the, the only thing I expect you guys to remember or to even really appreciate is the result of that derivation. <clears throat> the result says that the uncertainty in an observable A times the uncertainty in an observable B is always greater than or equal to one over twice I times the commutator of A and B. What that means is if, if the two observables commute with each other, that means it doesn't matter the order in which you perform measurements of those observables, then there's no limit to the uncertainty. In other words, the uncertainty can be as small as you like. On the other hand, if the two observables don't commute so that they have a finite commutator, then there is going to be an uncertainty limit, a, a limit on the uncertainty in those two measurements, below which you cannot go. Quantum mechanics does not permit you to go. And uh, we can check it using the momentum operator and the position operator, which you realize have a finite commutator. The commutator of x and p is i h bar. If you put that commutator into the expression, you get that the uncertainty in x times the uncertainty in p is always greater than or equal to h bar over 2, which is the uncertainty relation we've been using all along. So you get a sense of how that goes. And if you had any other observables, not necessarily momentum and position, but uh, we're going to find at some point, probably next semester, we'll talk about photons in cavities, and you'll find that the photon number and the photon phase, the phase of the photon wave function, um, 
have an uncertainty relation, something like this. We're going to find out in the next chapter, chapter 4, that various components of angular momentum uh, have limitations on the uncertainty. So you can't know the x and y component of angular momentum with arbitrary precision at the same time. So there you go. <clears throat> now let's, uh, let's uh, get some more experience with our Dirac notation. Suppose you have an operator q hat with eigenvectors q1 and q2. So in other words, <coughs> these are eigenvectors of the q operator. That means they correspond to precise values of q, but they're expressed in a, in a different basis uh, that could be the energy basis. Maybe q is angular momentum or q is some other observable, and we express the eigenstates of q in a different basis question is, oh, and don't forget that these two eigenvectors have different eigenvalues. So if you find the system in state q1 and you measured its q observable, you would get a value of 2. And if you measured it in, in state q2 and you measured its q observable, you'd get a, uh, a value of 3. So that's, uh, that's another uh, factor about the operator q. In fact, it turns out if you know an operator's eigenvectors and all its eigenvalues, then you know the operator completely, you know everything there is to know about that operator, basically. So we can literally deduce the matrix elements of the operator and everything else about the operator if we know those things. So, and we'll see how that works as we go along, but uh, suppose the system is currently in the state psi, which happens to be the E1 basis vector. The question is, if that's true, what's the expectation value of Q? So what we do is imagine, uh, go back to the basis vectors, and then the question is, given that the system is in the state E1, what's the amplitude that we would find the system in the state Q1? But notice that uh, there's a relationship between the amplitude of being in the state Q1 given that you're in E1, and the amplitude of being in the state E1 given that you're in Q1, and, and that is that they are complex conjugates of one another. But notice that these coefficients are all real, which means that in fact the amplitude to be in Q1 given that you're in E1 and the amplitude to be in E1 given that you're in Q1 are the same number because all these coefficients are real. So we can compute that amplitude uh, very easily by asking what is the amplitude to be in the state E1 given that you're in the state Q1. Obviously it's a half because that's the coefficient of E1 in the superposition that produces Q1. Similarly, oh, and so the probability of being in that state would be one half. Similarly, the probability of being in the state E1, given that you're in the state Q2, is the square root of 3 over 2, which means it has a probability of 3 fourths. Okay? So the probability of being in state E1, given that you're in state Q1, is 1 fourth. The probability of being in state E1, given that you're in state Q2, would be 3 fourths. And the probability of being in one or the other, it'd be one. So you either uh, have to be in one or the other. So uh, how do you calculate the expectation value? You take the probability of finding the system in state Q1 times the va eigenvalue Q1 plus the probability of being in state Q2 times the eigenvalue Q2. That's the standard technique for calculating expectation values. And if you plug all that in, you'll see that the answer is 11 fourths. Um, but there's a more formal way to do this. You can also, as we did before, just compute the expectation value of Q hat directly by putting in um, the definitions of psi, and it's convenient to stick in the identity. So we put in the identity operator, but we expand it in the Q basis. Why do we use the Q basis? Because we're using the Q operator, and in the Q basis, the Q operator's operation is trivial. You just multiply each or, uh, eigenvector by the corresponding eigenvalue. Let's see how that works. So we, we uh, take the summation outside, and then you notice that what you have there is Q hat acting on the ith eigenvector of Q. In other words, the Q sub i basis is the basis of eigenvectors of the, of the operator Q. And of course, that's just Q sub i times uh, the eigenket Q using the eigenvalue equation. But Q sub i is just a number. So in fact, we can bring it out. We get psi on Q sub i times Q sub i on psi. But that's just the 
amplitude of being in the state q sub i given that you're in the state psi. Um, but that's just the coefficient, right? That's just the co that's just the amplitude of being in the state q sub i. So that's easy. And again, we have uh, the normal way to calculate expectation values, um, probability of being in a state times the value that you get if you're in that state. Okay, so how would things change if we change the current state to be a superposition of eigenstates? What would happen then? Well, it's the same idea. You just calculate the amplitude of being in state Q1 given you're in the state Psi, and um, it's a bunch of inner products, but knowing the definition of Q1 and Q2, we can calculate the value of those inner products, and we can square them, and then we can calculate the expectation value in the standard way. So it turns out it's not that bad. Um, if you just go through the thing step by step, calculate the inner products uh, using the definitions of the eigenvectors, and uh, you get an answer. Okay, let's talk about a more concrete example. This concrete example is the ammonia molecule. So the ammonia molecule is a molecule that has three hydrogen atoms connected to a nitrogen atom. And uh, we know a fair amount about this guy. We're going to call the state that you see there to the left the up state. But there's a completely equivalent state that has exactly the same energy, has exactly the same basic geometry, except that it's upside down, like this. I'm going to call that the down state. Or we'll use the ket notation, D. So the up ket is the u ket, and the down ket is the d ket. Now what's the Hamiltonian going to be in this case? Well, if the ammonia molecule is in the up state, it has the same energy as if it's in the down state. Okay, so we call that, we can calculate the Hamiltonian matrix element, the up up matrix element, and the down down matrix element. Those have to be the same because of the symmetry of the problem. But another matrix element that's interesting is what happens if uh, you take the down component of what you get when you apply the Hamiltonian to the up state, or if you take the up component of what you get when you apply the Hamiltonian in the down state. <clears throat> it turns out that uh, the fact that this is not zero means that if the thing is in the up state, there's a finite probability that it can tunnel through and go to the down state. And if it's in the down state, there's a finite probability it can tunnel through and get to the up state. And that shows out up as an off-diagonal element of the Hamiltonian. So we can think of the up state as being the one zero state, the down state as being the zero one state, and then using those matrix elements that we just worked out, we can write the Hamiltonian out as a matrix. It, di diagonal elements are the energies when the thing is in uh, the up state and the energy when the thing is in the down state, and they're just the original energy of the molecule if it's not allowed to make transitions between those two states. And then the minus A it corresponds to an amplitude of the thing leaking through to the other way. So if it's in the down state, it can leak through and become up, and if it's in the up state, it can leak through and become down. Because of the way the Hamiltonian governs the time evolution of the system, this turns out to mean that the states up and down are not energy eigenstates because they're not stable. If you put the thing in the up state and you check a little while later, there's a chance you can find it in the down state. And if it's in the down state and you look a little while later, there's a chance you'll find it in the up state. So that means that up and down are not eigenstates. They're not stationary states of the Hamiltonian. The question is, what are the stationary states of the Hamiltonian? In other words, what are the solutions to the Schrodinger equation that H acting on an energy eigenstate is equal to the energy times the energy eigenstate? What, what states are going to have that property? So the, the way you handle that is you invent an arbitrary state, some arbitrary superposition of up and down, and call that an eigenstate. We don't know what the eigenstate is yet, but we can imagine that there is an eigenstate and that its amplitudes are alpha and beta, respectively. Then you plug that in to the Schrodinger equation, essentially, to the, to the eigenvalue problem, which means the Hamiltonian acting on alpha and beta must be equal to some number 
times alpha beta. But we don't know what the number is yet. But notice what we can do. I can multiply the right hand side with the identity and I can put the eigenvalue into the diagonal elements of the identity and I haven't changed the equation. But now I can subtract the identity from both sides and I've got an interesting formula. It says that some matrix acting on my eigenvector is equal to the zero vector. Now that's a very interesting formula because there, there of course is a trivial solution to that problem. If alpha and beta are both zero, then no matter what lambda is, that solution will be satisfied. That's not a very interesting solution because it's not a valid quantum state. But there is the possibility that you could find a quantum state, an eigenstate, that would satisfy this equation in a non-trivial case when alpha and beta are not zero. But it turns out that only happens for very special values of lambda, eigenvalues. So we want to find those eigenvalues. If you look at that thing for a little while, you realize that if you try to apply Kramer's rule to solve for alpha or beta, you're going to end up taking the determinant of that thing, and you'll be dividing zero by that determinant. The only way you can get a finite result is if that determinant is also zero. So zero divided by zero can sometimes be non-zero, it can be finite, um, but it only happens for very special cases of lambda where the determinant of that matrix works out to be zero. So we require, to find the eigenvalues, we simply require that that determinant be zero. That re reduces to an algebraic equation for lambda, and that's an equation that has two solutions because it's quadratic. So it turns out there are two eigenvalues. There's a plus and a minus eigenvalue. <clears throat> and those are the two energies of the system. Notice that it's either E0 plus A or E0 minus A. There's a low energy version, lambda minus, that's E0 minus A, and a high energy version, lambda plus, that's E0 plus A. Now, what could be the corresponding eigenvector? We'll call that lambda plus. Um, if we plug lambda plus back in, lambda plus is E0 plus A, and we, so we replace lambda plus with E0 plus A and solve the equations, um, you'll notice that what we get is minus A times alpha minus A times beta equals zero. But the only way that can be true is if alpha is minus beta, okay? Usually we like to normalize the eigenstates. So if we put in um, a normalization constant out in front, we find that the plus eigenstate is one over root two up minus down. So the high energy eigenstate turns out to be a superposition of up and down. What happens if uh, lambda equals lambda sub n equals lambda minus? We put in the eigenvalue lambda minus. Lambda minus, of course, is E0 minus A. Um, we cancel out the E0s and we get A alpha minus A beta equals zero. That has a solution. It's alpha equals beta. And so we get the low energy eigenvector. Turns out to be a different superposition of up and down. It's 1 over the square root of 2 up plus down. Okay, so let's summarize our results. We found two eigenvectors plus with an eigenvalue E0 plus A, and there's an eigenvector minus with an eigenvalue um, E0 minus A. Plus and minus are superpositions of up and down. One goes like the difference between up and down, <clears throat> the other goes like the sum of up and down. The other thing to notice is if you add plus and minus together, you get something that looks like up, and if you subtract them, you get something that looks like down. So you can express up and down also as superpositions of plus and minus. So it's, it's kind of a neat system. Um, we'll have time to talk about it in class, but uh, it's a nice playground f with which you, we can uh, get some appreciation for how these postulates work. The next time, we're going to be studying how these states evolve in time. So you get some sense of how this thing goes. All right, we'll see you next time.